The scripture today is from the first chapter of James, verses 1 through 18. Hear these words. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that in the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of all that he created. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now go ahead and leave, Harold. It's all right. <laughs> you don't need to waste your time listening to me preach. <clears throat> he said they were going to a homecoming today, so we'll, we'll just take him at his word. <clears throat> and four or five people have asked me now, well, how old are you? I didn't think it was right to ask people how old they were. So I'm going to ask some of y'all how old you are. But I'm 66 today, and it has flown by forever so fast. 44 years of working for the United Methodist Church, and I can't wait to 1230 when I go home. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, you have to understand, occasionally the bishop will tell us what to preach on. Occasionally the district superintendent will tell us what to preach on. And most of the time, church members tell me what to preach on. <laughs> and so enough people have said they would like for me to preach on the book of James. So we are starting that this morning. And then um, probably sometime around the 1st of October, we'll get back to my plans to preach on the seven churches in Revelation. So we have so much to learn as children of God. And that's what James is trying to tell people. For some of us, the most difficult, perhaps, is to learn how to regard the trials and tribulations in our life, even our tragedies that fall on us. 
and the tests that we come by our way without we even be asking for them. And how many times have we said, I didn't ask for this. How many times have we said, I don't deserve this. I don't believe God sends tragedies and tribulations and tests and trials, whatever you want to call them. I believe that things just happen as a part of life. And if you read the Gospels, you can see things happening as part of life. Sometimes things happen because people make bad choices and things happen. Occasionally, we make bad choices and things happen. Sometimes other people make bad choices and things happen. A week ago Sunday night, I was driving my car, stopped at a red light, and a 17-year-old made a bad choice of texting and ran into the back of me. But things happen. Some people say that God does not send them, but that he allows things to happen. We might want to rephrase that in a way that God has given us a lot of freedom and free will. Sometimes I feel like maybe a little too much. What I am sure of is that God loves us and all of us, and he didn't intend for any one of us to hate one another or be jealous of one another, or resent one another, or war against one another, or hurt one another, or be separated as the body of Christ. So when trials and tests come our way, I believe God can use them to draw us closer to him and to one another as the body of Christ. I believe in a God big enough whereby he can accomplish his purposes and his will no matter what. And God can use us and does use us and will continue to use us. He just may not tell us. And he certainly won't ask our permission. And we are so used to people asking our permission not in my life, but maybe in yours. So even when we keep trying to tell God what to do, and none of us will admit to that, but we do that all the time, I think it always helps us to remember that there is a God and we are not that God. We desperately need the wisdom to accept these painful events in our lives. Accept them with God's grace and with the joy he has given us, even when we don't recognize that joy. Knowing that whatever they may be, God can transform them from what is ugly and painful to something that is beautiful and full of hope. God can take what the evil one plots and plans and simply transform them into the purposes of God to begin with. Goodness will always overcome evil. One scholar said it this way, since we don't have a good understanding of evil, evil is not a thing. It is the lack of a thing. It is the lack of God's presence in our life. These conflicts that we engage in, the conflicts that we let eat us, the conflicts that we let get the best of us, all have their origin in the forces of evil that permeate our whole world, as well as in our own self-centered lives. One preacher said that we won't necessarily win every battle in this incessant war against the powers of the night, but the ultimate victory is in Jesus Christ, who is already ours. When we fall, we fall only to rise again. When we fail, we fail only to fight the war within again. And once again, we discover a forgiving and loving God indwelling in our hearts 
and strengthening our lives to fight that battle within us. It has never been difficult to see God's presence in the morning sunlight or something that we've been really successful at, we're able to see God's presence in it. Or just on any given Sunday morning, you come together as the body of Christ and we see God's presence. It has never really been difficult to imagine God's presence when things are going our way, when God does what we tell God to do. We really feel blessed at that point, and we let everybody know it. But when we recognize that God is with us in the worst of times, that God is with us during the trials and the tribulations and the tests that we go through, when we recognize that God is with us, even when we can experience the presence of God and God's peace and God's joy, then in the midst of our joy, even in the midst of God's peace, we can be mindful that we can be trapped by trials and tribulations if that's what we want to happen. It's a choice. If we attempt to fight our selfish desires by ourselves, we are in for the defeat of our lives. If we attempt to fight our own prideful ways by ourselves, we are in for eventual destruction. Courting those inner fires can lead to us getting burned. So James, the Lord's brother, is what some scholars believe who wrote this. So James just says, stop. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop believing the wrong ways. Faith in God and trust in God and his truth and grace will give us the edge and the final victory. There is something else that we must learn as the children of God. It is not enough to be listeners of the gospel. It is not enough to be the proclaimers of the gospel message. We must be doers of the gospel word. Each one of us has been commissioned to be doers of the word of God. And when our Christian faith fall short of the evidence or the fruit in our lives to those who are suffering around us, then we fall short of our genuine faith. And that is what separates the sheep from the goats, as Matthew said. It may seem like a small matter, but it translates into a gigantic flaw in the lives of most of us as Christians. We dare to call ourselves believers in and followers of Jesus Christ, and then we go out into the world and act like outright unforgiven people in our relationships with others, with the people who cross our paths. If we look carefully and honestly, we may recognize this to be one of the greatest problems in our lives that we are among those who talk nonstop about loving humanity, but we are so selective about which people we love in humanity that we almost forget to accept and love and forgive all the people that God accepts and loves and forgives. No wonder we don't like the book of James. No wonder we say to the preacher, who told you to preach on the book of James? No wonder we don't read the book of James. No wonder it makes us terribly uncomfortable. Maybe folks expect us to be very particular about who we live with and confide in or forgive. But when we show greater respect for those who are, who are just like us, we just don't want to admit it. The same race, the same color, the same economic status, the same of us, 
when we show greater respect for those just like us, we are making distinctions that our Lord Jesus Christ did not make, does not make, and will not make. We are commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when our judgment of people or our actions toward them are determined by the color of their skin or the label in the back of their shirt or the size of their bank account, we are not acting like children of God. We are not acting like servants of God. And the least we could do is let God change us. So when we think about it, you realize that we are sinning against God and endangering our relationship with God. And when we neglect to give equal respect to the value of all God's children, I don't believe it would hurt any of us to re-examine our motives, blast out some of our silly notions that we grew up with that no longer we find truth in, shake up the ideas that are embedded in our minds that determine the responses to God's people. And I don't think it would hurt us to learn how to be loving and compassionate towards God's children in today's world and ultimately forgive those who need forgiving, which I suspect is a very long list. I know it is in my life. A list, I might add, that includes our name. Some of us are still hooked on the one these religious ideas and that religious faith is something that we just do on Sunday morning. And if we make it here on Sunday morning and scoot out, that we ought to have clear sailing the rest of the week. We may not like to admit it, but the facts speak for themselves. Just because you are here on Sunday morning does not mean you're going to have clear sailing the rest of the week. Sometimes we are just all mouth, as James says. And that is exactly what James is trying to teach us. And whatever the reason, because of the fear in our lives, or the pride, or the apathy, or the greed, or the selfishness, or the possibility that we haven't yet really embraced God's love, we are demonstrating what a far cry we are from the Christian faith. We ought to have it by now. Some of us ought to to get it by now. There is Sunday where we rejoice and give thanks to God. And then there's Monday. We ought to be giving our faith away to others. Some of us are afraid to give our faith away to others because we're not sure what they would do with our faith. Or what if they had more faith than us once we give it away? So we're going to play it all safe. We keep our own faith. We keep our generous spirit. We keep our kindness. We keep our respect. We keep our honor. We keep our forgiveness all locked, locked up tied in a shoebox at the back of our closet. The problem is we have forgotten which closet we put that shoebox in. So even if we wanted to forgive somebody, <coughs> I just can't do it, not today. I might be able to do it tomorrow. Or if they say something kind to me after what they said earlier, we can't even find the shoebox. And even if we did, the duct tape is wrapped so tightly around it that we probably couldn't even get it open to let our faith out, to let loose of our forgiveness toward others, to share with our generous spirit that God previously has given to us, and to give away the grace that God has made sure we are aware of in our lives, to share the love of God that we already have. And yet, we still can't understand why others 
don't seem to forgive us. Sometimes it helps to call a spade a spade. Sometimes it helps to tear down the window dressing and let the truth come out. That's what happens to us when we let the spiritual truth come out. Sometimes it helps to just throw away the labels and have the courage to confront the painful truth that we can't talk faith unless we live faith. And we can't talk forgiveness until we offer it to those we have decided don't deserve the forgiveness. We can't talk faith until we walk it. We can't talk generous spirit until we look at ourselves at the very people in the situations or the mission projects that God puts right under our nose and we just ignore. And when we have the faith that Jesus proclaimed and demonstrated, we will in turn live it and demonstrate it in sacrificial love for the whole human family. All people belong to God. Let us stop playing games with God. We can't win those games anyway. We've already tried. We know what the results are. Let us stop playing games with each other. Let us stop accepting only what suits our own needs. And then we can embrace God with all of his promises. We have been called by God to serve God by serving others. Let's see what we can do about that. What do you say? And while we're at it, consider it nothing but joy. Why not? Let us pray. Gracious God, the spiritual truth comes out within us. And sometimes we just need to be renewed. And we need to think ahead of ourselves instead of behind ourselves. And we need to come to you regaining the grace and joy and peace and forgiveness that you've already given to us. For all of the gifts that you have put in our lives, we give thanks. And we praise your holy name. We praise the holy name of your Son and our Savior through our prayers and through our life. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, number 2279 out of the faith we sing and the words will be on the screen. <laughs>